welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you. You too, Keisha. We've talked about Black Panther on the show previously, and we have been tr- given a treat. Not only did Marvel release a movie with Black Panther in it, it has Black Panther and all his Marvel superhero friends, Avengers, Infinity War. If you haven't seen it, go, go, go. Okay, now it's time to talk about sports, Mike. I just figured I need to, to let everybody know. You're welcome, Marvel. So we are now in the second round of the NBA playoffs. Mike, give me your impressions. Have your predictions come to pass, or do you need to make any adjustments? Well, first off, Keisha, it kills me to say this, but hats off to the Boston Celtics. This is a team that, with all the injuries that they've had, great job by them to get past the Milwaukee Bucks and advance now to the second round. And the same can be said for another New York rival, the Philadelphia 76ers, with their impressive job going up against the Miami Heat. So I give credit to those two teams. I'm really intrigued, though, by this matchup between the Toronto Raptors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. I do think that the winner of that series will wind up going on to the NBA Finals. It's very very enticing. More credit and, and hats off to LeBron James with a terrific job against the Indiana Pacers. In the Western Conference, I would say, and, and I'll finish up with this, I was I was very disappointed with the OKC Thunder. I thought I, I expected a little bit more from them. I like what I've seen from New Orleans and Utah. When it comes down to it, it's going to be Houston going up against Golden State, and the winner of that should wind up making uh, the NBA Finals. But so far, so good with these NBA playoffs. They've been very exciting. Right. Uh, with you, Mike, LeBron James, Herculean performance to get the Cavs out of the first round, defeating the Indiana Pacers. It was not easy. After the, the Game 7, LeBron said he was tired, he was spent. And, I mean, I just wonder how how long he can keep up this pace because he ha- really has to do the lion's share of the work, unfortunately, because his supporting cast has not really given him the help that he needs. But, you know, Kyle Korver has been a, a nice surprise um, in what he's been able to do. So maybe this will give the Cavaliers, the rest of the Cavaliers, some momentum going forward. Uh, but we'll see how far LeBron can take them. And if he can actually bring this team to the conference finals, I think we have to investigate if LeBron James is part, part cyborg because he is, he's unreal what he's been able to do given the amount of minutes he's played and his, his age. I mean, basketball-wise, he's getting up there. But um, like you, OKC, I was really disappointed. I could not believe how thoroughly outplayed they were at times by the Utah Jazz and hats off to head coach for the Utah Jazz, Quinn Snyder, who really – got his team to perform and make it to the playoffs in a a season where people weren't sure. They lost Gordon Hayward. They lost Rodney Hood during the uh, trade deadline in February. So um, hats off Donovan Mitchell really making his case for Rookie of the Year. I I did not see him him coming like this, and I'm sure all the other teams that picked before him (laughs) didn't see it either. Um, Anthony Davis really putting the world on notice and letting him know, letting the world know that he is also on the rise and he could also challenge LeBron for the the next best thing. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the keys being handed over to Kevin Durant, but I think Anthony Davis is making the case, hey, me too. I, I'm, I'm right there. Um, and then uh, Boston Celtics, great series against the Bucks. Um, Jason Tatum, you know, who I always root for, my fellow Duke alum, um, really not playing like a rookie. He is really so poised. And I think there was a name, the nickname called Jay Smooth, and we'll see why. <laughs> Well, Keisha, we keep it with basketball, and of course, this saga going on with the San Antonio Spurs and Kawhi Leonard, where he played a total of nine games last year because he was nursing that quad injury that he had to deal with, and of course, currently, he's been in New York really trying to get some rehab on that injury that he's faced. Well, reportedly, Keisha, Leonard does want to return to the Spurs, but he wants Coach Craig Popovich uh, to make some changes, and, and specifically, he wants him to lighten up on practice. Now, Keisha, I ask you, when it's all said and done, will Leonard be wearing a Spurs uniform next year? Oh, definitely. One, because he's not a free agent. The, sp- the Spurs have his rights, and unless they want to trade him, 
he will be wearing the silver and black. And by all accounts, it doesn't look like the Spurs are ready to move on from Kawhi. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it's been reported that Greg Popovich wants to meet with Kawhi Leonard over the summer and to talk about what's going on and how he and by extension the organization can repair this relationship. I mean, Kawhi's been with the Spurs for quite some time now and we've never really heard any rumblings of discontent by either party. So it d- makes me believe that this is a, a bump in the road and not something that could be um, representative of a permanent fracture in the relationship. And if anybody could get Kawhi back on board, it'd be Greg Popovich, see LaMarcus Aldridge. LaMarcus Aldridge had a really tough time uh, prior to the start of this year. And I think, you know, he was discontent and he had a meeting with Popovich. And by all means, by all accounts, uh, Lamar Gage is happy to be with the Spurs. And also, honestly, the Spurs are the team that can offer Kawhi the most money. You know, he's this is the, his last uh, year under his current contract, and he's going to be looking to cash out. And the Spurs can offer him the most contract money, over $200 million. And if he goes elsewhere, um, he's not going to make that much. Um, and, and the Spurs are one of the the best organizations in the NBA and maybe all of sports. And I think, you know, he, he would, it would be to his best interest to try to see if he can work it out. I don't know if Pop will make practices less stringent because it's worked for him so far. Uh, but maybe I, I would imagine that they would be taking a look at the medical staff and some of the, the training and rehab there because that seems to be the bone of contention with Kawhi and the Spurs. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think most likely he is, he is going to wind up being with the Spurs next season. But this is going to linger. This is something that people are going to be talking about uh, going up until deep into the playoffs next year when the, when the Spurs do get Kawhi back and he will be with the team next season, which we're both expecting that to be. And the Spurs are always a playoff contender, but this is something that's going to be circulating around this team, uh, this franchise, for, for you know months to come until we find out what's going to happen when his free agency is up. But I agree with you, Keisha. I think when it's all said and done, the Spurs aren't going to lo- unload him in this offseason. They've made it clear that they want to work things out with him uh, when it comes down to it. I think also... From Kawhi Leonard's standpoint, maybe there's been also some talk that he might be more interested in going to a bigger market as opposed to playing in San Antonio. Who knows really what's going to wind up happening, but I think when it comes down to it, without a doubt, he will be playing with San Antonio next year. I mean, I think Kawhi is best suited for one of those mid-markets, and I don't think he is really suited for the lights of New York, L.A., and some of the larger markets because he is a very... by. Um, by reports, a very quiet person, um, somebody who just would show up to work and, and go home. And the media in both New York and L.A. can be quite intense. And I, I feel as though it wouldn't really suit him. I don't think that it would make him happy. So we'll see um, how this develops. We're going to move from the hard courts of the NBA to the gridiron of the NFL. And Mike, the 2018 NF- NFL draft is in our rearview mirror. So aside from the picks made by the New York teams, what um, what teams, what players are you excited to be watching this upcoming season? Were there any funny antidotes or you know, draft stories that you may have heard and might want to share with everyone? It was a great draft. I mean, this is one of the most, you know, this will go down in history. People will be talking about this draft for many, many years to come. Whether these quarterbacks pan out or whether they don't, this is a quarter, This is a draft, obviously, that was dominated by the quarterbacks. Four out of the top ten, five uh, altogether in the first round. For me, the big thing here is the Cleveland Browns, you know, going against what a lot of people did not expect by taking Baker Mayfield. He's a shorter quarterback. Uh, I was a little bit taken aback by that, but I've gotten used to it now where I've I've read up on some of the stories. Uh, Of course, we'll get to the Jets and Giants later on. But, you know, look, I think a team like the Denver Broncos absolutely lucked out by getting Bradley Chubb. I thought one of the most fitting... Uh, moments. Probably the best part of the NFL draft was Brian Chazier coming out with the Pittsburgh Steelers pick late in the first round. Uh, that was something that was very moving, seeing him walk on stage the way that he did. And again, the the big thing, what I'll, I'll finish with this, is 
you're never going to get another draft where the first pick in the first round and the 32nd pick of the first round are back-to-back Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks with Baker Mayfield and Lamar Jackson. There's so much more that we can continue to get into, and of course we will talk about the New York teams. But to me, overall, I, I really enjoyed this draft for what it was. Right. Uh, one of the, the best stories I found was Shaquem Griffin, who was is a linebacker who was selected by the Seattle Seahawks, and what's unique about him is that he lost his left hand, I believe, uh, due to a a rare condition that he had, uh, I think, prior to birth. And he was drafted by the Seahawks, and his brother is a Seahawk. So not only did he overcome obstacles to achieve his dream of making it in the NFL, he gets to do it with his brother. And I think that was a really nice story. Uh, Another person I am interested in watching the upcoming season is quarterback Josh Allen I mean I'm sorry Josh Rosen because he boldly declared that nine teams ahead of him made mistakes he was picked number 10 and he said all those other people made nine mistakes so I want to see what comes out when uh, camp opens and how he's performing because that's a really bold declaration and then I'll uh, uh, end it by saying uh, staying on the quarterbacks is Lamar Jackson um, I, I found, um, you know, Lamar was a former Heisman Trophy winner, as you mentioned, but there was a lot of questions about him um, in this draft, where he should be. Uh, some people, I don't think, had him going in the first round, and there was even talk where it was suggested that he even change positions and be a wide receiver, to which he boldly declared that he wasn't going to do that. He wants to be an NFL quarterback. He believes that he can achieve on the next level, and I'm waiting to see. And he's in a, a nice position in Baltimore because there is a real chance that he could win the starting position if, you know, off season goes well for him. Yeah. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back with more of What's Poppin'. And now we have Quick Bites. Utah Jazz guard Ru- Ricky Rubio could miss the second round of playoffs due to a hamstring injury. Newly minted NFL quarterback Josh Allen had to apologize after racial tweets from his high school days surfaced. According to ESPN's Zach Lowe, the Knicks may be interested in interviewing Jawan Howard for the head coach position. OKC Thunder small forward, for now, Paul George is reportedly considering taking his talents to the Philadelphia 76ers and staying in OKC after his team's first round exit Russell Westbrook let the world know that he did not appreciate the heckling that he received from Utah fans during the series. Mike, we got a quick question for you. Do you think that Joe Prunty, Prunty, sorry, of the Milwaukee Bucks will be the head coach next season? I don't think so. I think they're going to wind up going out and getting a big name coach, whether it's Mike Budenholzer or a lot of these guys that the Knicks have been interviewing. I think that they're going to wind up moving on and bringing somebody who um, has some more experience and is, and is a, somebody that can handle the Greek freak. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, with you, I think he's, he's done. Uh, there's been questionable calls that he has made throughout the playoffs and probably during the series. He's got talent on the roster, but maybe doesn't really know how to best utilize them. So we'll see. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, we're going to continue our talk about the NBA playoffs. And round one saw some pretty interesting storylines. One uh, being John Wall of the Washington Wizards. After, during his post-game presser, after the Wizards were bounced by the Toronto Raptors in round one, he put the organization on notice, um, letting him know that he, you know, there's some changes that need to be made. And Carmelo Anthony... Also um, had some interesting words. Um, he was benched for approximately 11 minutes during the last game of the playoff series, and um, before his lack of defense. And then, you know, he had some some theories about what's going to happen to him next year. But um, Mike, where do you think Carmelo and John Wall will be next year? Well, we start with Carmelo. Carmelo, it, b- both. The Thunder and Carmelo, they're in between a rock and a hard place. 
And that's because Carmelo Anthony is stuck with this contract, right, which he is not going to opt out of because no one in a million years is going to give, give him a, a third of what he's going to be, what he's getting for next season. Um, and he's not willing to accept this bench role. So I think when it comes down to it, OKC is going to have to wind up finding a two or three team trade where they're going to be able to get rid of Carmelo Anthony. I can't imagine after what happened this season that they're going to be able to, to, to bring him back into the fold. And he's not going to be part of the starting lineup. He's going to be a bench player. With the same, having said that, you know there is some sympathy that I have for Carmelo Anthony. It, has, it hasn't been an easy go for him. Now, obviously, he's had these off the court issues with his with his marriage and everything. And then, of course, the way things played out by play, when he came was playing in New York, and then the whole situation that's gone on with OKC this season. But it's going to be interesting to see how it all does play out. But I think most likely the Thunder and Carmelo Anthony will find up. We'll find out, we'll come up with a way to get rid of him for for next season, uh, and find a team where he can play and, and start. John Wall, on the other hand, I think in some ways the way that he came out and he he just really threw his teammates under the bus after he missed half of a season, uh, I thought in some ways was kind of disgraceful. I understand that you know he's a competitor and they won the eighth seed this year. They played a tough series against Toronto, but you know to do what he did to his teammates, and I get it. You know the, the knock on John Wall has been that. Uh, his teammates don't like him and that they have a lot of this friction, but he could have kept that in-house. All the comments that he made, I'm okay with it, but don't, you don't have to go out necessarily to the media. Again, in some ways I respect his competitive desire and a lot of the things that he said, he is completely right about. The guy wants to win, he wants to compete, but when you're doing and what the comments that you're making, when you're throwing your teammates under the bus the way that he did, I thought in a lot of ways he, you know, that, he didn't have to go about it that way. Right. Uh, with John Wall, I think there was a lot of tit for tat because while he was out uh, due to his injury, there were comments from his teammates made about him, either explicitly mentioning his name or indirectly indirectly mentioning him, and in regards to how much better the team played while he wasn't on the court. So there was a tit for tat, and I guess he, sh- you know, he could have probably been the bigger person and not have continued that line of conversation in the public eye. But we'll see what changes that the Wizards will be able to make in terms of bolstering the roster because they are going to have to do a little math wizardry (laughs) (laughs) because uh, John Wall, Bradley Bill are two people who take a, a lot of salary space. And in terms of Carmelo Anthony, look, he's... He's going to be with the Thunder, I believe, because like you said, $28 million is a big price for somebody, for another team to play, I mean, to pay, and for him to demand, especially coming off the season that he just had. So um, I I just don't see another team just willing to pay $28 million for Carmelo Anthony outright. So maybe a trade could happen, but by default, Carmelo may be a starter because we don't know where Paul George is going to be. He is a free agent this summer and we don't know where he's going to be. He might decide to stay in OKC or he might decide to go to LA. We we mentioned that he might go to the Sixers. So if Paul George is gone, Melo might by default get a a starting position. Um, And also I will say for Carmelo, I I do feel a little bit of empathy because he did say that he felt as though there was no plan for him. Uh, in terms of the organization when they brought him on. And maybe he felt as though he, he could have been, been better utilized. So which brings me to look at Billy Donovan and and the OKC Thunder. If you think about it, there, wasn't, there was a time where OKC had Serge Ibaka, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden on one team. And you have two of those three people are all-stars, multi-all-stars, and one that's really one or two making a push or three actually (laughs) push for you know nba all-time greats and they disbanded that team you got paul george you took a big risk for a one-year rental you bought carmelo anthony but then you fall flat and i feel as though now it's time to be to look at billy donovan and okc yeah well, Keisha, we move on to Donald Trump, who tweeted his support for a United States bid to co-host the 2026 Soccer World Cup with a veiled threat against nations that were, could oppose it. Uh, Trump's tweet stated, The U.S. has put together a strong bid with Canada and Mexico for the 2026 
World Cup. It would be a shame if countries that we always support were to lobby against the U.S. bid. Why should we be supporting these countries when they don't support us, including the United Nations? With this statement, Trump violated FIFA regulations regarding interfering with the bidding process. So, Keisha, could this action cause the United States to lose the opportunity to co-host the 2026 World Cup? I mean, this guy is a walking disaster. <laughs> anyway, him, his medical records ever released? Because if they did, I'm sure he was diagnosed with diarrhea of the mouth. This guy just cannot keep his mouth closed. And he did violate some federal, you know, FIFA regulations. So it is in jeopardy. Now, I don't know how serious of an offense this is. I mean, I guess it could be considered tampering or... I don't know, extortion, I don't know if extortion is the right word, or blackmail, or, or something, like, if you don't do this, then we're not going to do that, so I, we could be in a little bit of trouble. Now, FIFA has had a history of not being quietly above board, so maybe there might be some backdoor channels to kind of keep our bid safe, but um, who knows, he, he just did not make things easy for us. Right. He doesn't care about the World Cup. He just wants to have people speaking about him. And it's all about bullying. And it's all about uh, putting people in their place. You know, remember when he referred to these countries as asshole countries. And these are the people now that he wants their support. So I think this is all about him just stirring the pot. Whether it's negative or positive, as long as people are speaking about Donald Trump, he's satisfied with that. As long as he's poking that bear and getting people to, like, again, he, you know, he's bringing this up just to get some controversy going, just so that we're speaking about him. And a lot of it is just these, this bullying that he's been doing way before he became president. Sure, sure. So, <laughs> well, oh, don't go anywhere. Stick with us because coming up is our New York Sports Report. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We are in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report. The New York Knicks head coach search is still underway, and the Knicks have interviewed a laundry list of candidates, and word on the street is that David Blatt and Mike Budenholzer are the front runners. Do you think, Mike, that the Knicks will select either Blatt or Budenholzer for that new head coaching position, over Mark Jackson or David Fisdale? If so, how do you think fans will react? You know, I think that Fisdale is really, over the last couple of days from what I've been reading in the papers, Fisdale has jumped into the number one or number two spot as far as who the Knicks should wind up targeting. And Budenholzer, of course, is also in the mix. I don't see them going after David Blatt. I think that, you know, his relationship with Steve Mills is something that certainly uh, is going to bring him into the mix. But I don't think that it's going to wind up with David Blatt. As far as Mark Jackson's concerned, I think that if the Knicks wanted to go make a push for Mark Jackson, they probably would have hired the guy already. So I think at this point, the Knicks are walking a fine line because what's happened is, let's say that they have a guy that they actually want. They could have hired him five days ago. Now, let's say that you want to hire Mike Budenholzer. You could have hired him last week. Then at the same time, the Milwaukee Bucks are going to jump right into the mix because they could wind up wanting a new coach. And that's certainly more of a lucrative job than the Knicks because you got the Greek Freak and a bunch of Jabari Parker, small market where the pressure isn't, and you don't have to deal with, with James Dolan. So when it comes down to it, I think the best fit for the Knicks is Fizdale. I think this is a guy that did well in Memphis. I know that he had some issues with with Mark Gasol, but I think that he, there's just something about the guy going back to his days in Miami when he was an assistant coach. He just seems to work very well with players and I think that when it comes down to me, I think that's who the Knicks need to go after. I'd be really surprised if they chose David Blatt. I just don't see him being a fit based on the fact that, one, he achieved a lot of success because of the roster that he had. He had LeBron James and I think, uh, whew, I forgot, Kyrie and other people who really were super talented and still are and could carry teams very far. But you see that that didn't work out. And with the Knicks, he doesn't have that kind of roster and he doesn't have enough of a proven record in the NBA for me to think that he should get this job over some of the other candidates mentioned. So I don't think the fans would be happy if David Blatt was chosen. Mike Budenholzer might be a, a better pill To swallow, uh, seen as though he was able to turn the Atlanta Hawks franchise around not too long ago, they were a playoff team. They had a dismal season this year because I believe they're in the process of rebuilding, but um, he has 
shown that he can work with talent. So I, I'm with you. I think I, I like David Fisdale as the front runner, the number one candidate. But I also have an affinity for Mark Jackson. I think that he would really do a great job. Yeah. Well, we go back to the NFL, Keisha, and of course the the Giants and the Jets made their picks. Of course, the Giants taking uh, Saquon Barkley uh, with the second pick, and the Jets get Sam Darnold. What did you think uh, as far as these picks went, and are you happy with what ha- with with your expectations? Welcome to the Big Apple, Saquon. I am pleased with this uh, pick. I like. I don't know how many people are were of my mindset, but I w- was not in love with any of these quarterbacks. So I was okay with the, the Giants not choosing uh, using their second pick or their first pick, which was number two overall, on a quarterback. I think Saquon. Their the the reports on him is that he is a better version of Ezekiel Elliott, and we saw what he was able to do. Uh, Ezekiel, that is, what he was able to do his first year in the NFL. Now, my only trepidation about having Saquon is, is can he be as effective with a weak offensive line? Ezekiel Elliott had the gift, the privilege of having one of the best offensive lines in front of him. The Giants don't have that. They're working on building that. So I'm wondering if his talents will be able uh, be enough to overcome that deficiency. And Sam Darnold for the New York Jets... Uh, it was predictable. I knew that they would grab a quarterback. Josh McCown is not the answer. He's more of a short-term solution. They're looking for that franchise quarterback. I just want to know what they're going to do with their the quarterbacks they already have on their roster. They signed Teddy Bridgewater in the offseason. Bryce Petty. Bryce Petty hasn't been, you know, knock your socks off when he's whenever he's had an opportunity to play. Uh, we haven't seen Christian Hackenberg. At least I don't recall seeing him. And they drafted him in, um, you know, with one of their first picks a couple years ago. So I I just want to see where they're going to go in terms of quarterbacks. Yeah, I think with Barkley, I thought it was a great move. You know, I thought, as you pointed out, if if these quarterbacks were so good, you look at somebody like John Elway, who has been starving for a quarterback ever since Peyton Manning retired a few years ago after they won the Super Bowl with the Denver Broncos. If it's a guy like like John Elway, who has the fifth pick in the draft, and he's not going to trade up to go get one of these guys, to me it's showing you that, you know what, I, I'm not as impressed with some of the stuff. And you don't see some of these teams jumping up. I know that, you know, of course, the Buffalo Bills and the Arizona Cardinals moved up, but I think that they were a little bit lukewarm on these guys, as you pointed out. So with the Giants, uh, I thought it was a good decision to go after Barkley. The running game has been pathetic over the last several years. Uh, so this is something that certainly can rejuvenate this franchise. The Jets, this was a no-brainer. You had to go after Donald. He was the best, most ready NFL quarterback, is what people have been saying, although some have been saying it's Rosen. But for the most part, this was the guy that they had to go after. So it's going to be fun watching both of these teams, see how they handle these. I mean, this is the first time that Giants and Jets together have had top picks like this. And again, I think, as we pointed out earlier, it was a great draft overall, uh, just watching it and everything. And for the Giants, you know, they did make some additions to the offensive line. They drafted a young quarterback um, with, I think, in the third or fourth round. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out with Davis Webb. But overall, I like the picks by both the Giants and Jets. And now we're going to go off topic. Thanks to a public outcry, rapper Meek Mill is out of prison and he will be waiting for his next hearing in June. However, he will be facing the same judge by the name of Janice Brinkley who put him in jail without bail for a parole violation. Well, Mike, it's about that time. We say goodbye to all of our friends, but you guys can keep up with us until we meet again by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 401 Sports TV. Be sure to download our podcast on Google Play Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us at What's the 401 Sports, and we look forward to checking you out again. 